today. The prayer warriors who are changing Washington. I think now's the best time to be alive. Now's the best time to be praying. And changing our nation along the way. Otherwise, why else would he give us prayer? Plus, a pitching lesson from the LA Dodgers, Clayton Kershaw. Forcing fastball across the laces like that. CBN Sports sits down with a three-time Cy Young winner. What ignites that competitive drive for you? I'm pitching for a lot more than just winning a baseball game. And learns the secret to his craft. I didn't do anything to deserve the talent you know, that God gave me. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Shock and horror out of Las Vegas. It's the worst mass shooting in modern U.S. history. A gunman opened fire from the 32nd floor of a Las Vegas casino last night. He unleashed a shower of bullets on a country music concert. And guess, oh, he killed more than 50 people. And more than 400 were injured. It's the worst tragedy in American history. Well, people ran for their lives, as you can imagine, trying to escape the hail of gunfire. Now the shooter is dead as police are investigating this horrifying attack. Jenna Browder brings us the story. What started as a country music concert turned into a bloody massacre overnight. Get down. Get down. The shooting happened near the Mandalay Bay Casino. Witnesses reported hearing hundreds of shots. My buddy's like, I just got hit, you know, and uh, got hit three times, and then people started diving for the ground, and it just continued, and it was pretty much chaotic. We refused to believe it was a shooting um, until it just kept going and going, and then Chase Naldine left the stage, and then everybody started fleeing. SWAT teams were sent to the resort, clearing out the 29th floor and working their way up. Through investigation and response, we determined there was a shooter on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay. Um, officers responded to that location and engaged the suspect at that location. He is dead. Police have identified the gunman as Stephen Paddock. Mary Lou Danley, his companion, is also now in custody as a person of interest. <laughs> Duty police officers are among the dead. Two more officers were also hurt. President Trump addressed the shooting on Twitter. My warmest condolences and sympathies to the victims and families of the terrible Las Vegas shooting. God bless you. Jason Aldean posted on Instagram asking for people to pray for the victims. With the gunman now dead, police are trying to determine what his motive was for killing so many people. Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. I had in my devotions today, I was reading uh, in uh, uh, Samuel, and it said, Lord, confuse the wicked, confound their words, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they prowl about on its warm. Malice and abuse are within it. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave its streets. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying to make sense of this. I'm sure you are, and maybe we can uh, come to some conclusion. But our CBN News correspondent, Gary Lane, is here. And Gary, you've been on top of this story. Tell yes. us what you've learned. Well, we've learned that this gunman is 64 years old. He's now deceased. He killed himself as police and SWAT teams stormed his hotel room on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Hotel. Apparently, they found the location because not only was he shooting from there, and they say, okay, where is it coming from? But the smoke alarms went off because of all the gunfire. And so they were able to locate him. He, he killed himself before that. Uh, we know that about him. We also know that he's 64. He was a, uh, living in a retirement community about 15 miles outside of Las Vegas. The motive? Don't know the motive yet. Now, there's one report that he uh, was in the middle of a messy divorce uh, from his wife, but his girlfriend was also with him uh, at the hotel. I don't believe she was in the room at the time. 
Well, has she got anything to do with it that we know, or she was well, just with him? There, there are reports that she has been questioned by police and, uh, and freed, free to go at this point. Gary, the, he killed 50 people, and yes. he wounded, uh, what, 200, 400? At least 200. Uh, some reports are saying now it's up to 400. 400. Yes. What kind of Injured. weapon did he have to do that? Well, he had two platforms. In, the police found two platforms in the hotel room and eight firearms. One must have been an AK-47 or some type of variant to fire off that many rounds. And he also had a lot of am ammunition there. But we don't know what led him to do that. It's so horrible. Well, could it have been his uh, divorce? Could it have been something else? We do know that he was not a military veteran. Uh, he was known by Las Vegas police. Uh, he had filed a lawsuit uh, in 2012 against one of the hotel casinos for negligence. I think that was dismissed mm -hmm. without prejudice. Uh, but that's all we know about him at this point. I'm sure the police and authorities now are at his home. They obtained a warrant searching through his computer, searching mm -hmm. through his cell phone, any records that may show where he purchased the automatic weapon, how he got a hold of that. Uh, the other firearms and 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 what his motive may have been. But this whole thing, this was not Allah Akbar or any of this Muslim stuff. This wasn't ISIS or any of these. Well, groups. wouldn't you think initially? I think the thoughts were maybe this was ISIS yes, because sure. they had threatened to hit Las <laughs> Vegas. They had just had a lone gunman uh, up in Edmonton, uh, Canada, uh, with an ISIS flag in one of his vehicles. So everyone thought, well, this might be ISIS again hitting hitting Las Vegas, but it was not. It was likely a lone gunman, 64-year-old man, who knows what his motive was. Violence in the streets, ladies and gentlemen. Why is it happening? You know, what I'd like to give you is the fact that we have disrespect for authority. There is profound disrespect of our president all across this nation. They say terrible things about him. It's in the news. It's in other places. There's disrespect now for our national anthem, disrespect for our veterans, disrespect for the institutions of our government, disrespect for the, the court system, all the way up and down the line, disrespect. And when you lose that kind of respect, you lose its authority. But more than anything, until there is biblical authority, there has to be some controlling authority in our society. And there is none. And when the, there is no vision of God, the people say, there's no vision of God, the people run amok. When there's no vision of God, the people run amok. And that we, we have taken from the American people the vision of God, the whole idea of reward and punishment, an ultimate uh, judge of all our actions, we've taken that away. And when there is no vision of God, the people run amok. That's my take on this. Gary, thank you yes. so much. Thank you. God bless you. Well, in other news, the Supreme Court will begin its new term on Monday. And they'll be taking up a very important case involving religious freedom. Wendy Griffith has that. Thanks, Pat. The high court is scheduled to tackle several high-profile cases dealing with controversial issues this term. One of the most closely watched involves a Colorado baker's religious objections to making a cake for a recently married same-sex couple. Jack Phillips is the Christian owner of the Colorado bakery. He says he shouldn't be forced to put a message on the cake that conflicts with his religious beliefs. The case involves a Colorado law that forbids discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. The Trump administration is backing the Christian baker. Well, baseball wrapped up its regular season Sunday, and the Los Angeles Dodgers won more games than any other team in either major league. An amazing 104 victories. And some members of the team have another goal, to tell their fans how Jesus has affected their lives. Sports reporter Tom Buring brings us that story. Amid the Los Angeles Dodgers' heightened playoff surge, Dodger Stadium transforms into a makeshift sanctuary, banding together players and fans for Christian Faith Day. You know, every year it's a, it's a special day because it kind of collides with baseball and, and Christianity. Christian Faith Day, 
Is that significant for any reason? Well, yeah, I mean, we definitely make a point uh, once a year to uh, to have a day like this so we can all come out and share to, to those uh, that want to stick around and, and listen to our message. Three-time Cy Young Award winner Clayton Kershaw and five-time All-Star Adrian Gonzalez serve as co-host of the post-game gathering. It's part of, uh, you know, I think what, what Jesus would want us yeah. to do. For us, it's, it's, it's incredible to just be able to, to share the gospel and, and talk about, you know, what God has done in, in our lives. If someone hasn't heard of Jesus or if someone hasn't talked to anybody about it, that we might uh, open the door to about what Jesus is about in our lives that might affect some people and uh, have God work in their lives. I know that God gave them this platform for a reason, yeah. you know, and they're using it for good. My children will know that they can accomplish all things through Christ. You know, put it all out there for him, have that relationship, and, and stay in prayer. Uh, stay in the Bible, and, uh, you know, when you have that focus on Jesus, everything else takes care of itself. Players encourage fans through their message, and Crowder, a Baseball Faith Day regular, inspires them with his music. Sing songs that I believe are truth, and I think when you encounter truth, something turns in your chest, and we're getting the opportunity to be able to show love. An organization like the Dodgers and players that are, you know, giving themselves to make a day like this happen, it's just it's a good thing to be a part of to not just connect as a fan, but as a part of the body of Christ. How cool is that for you up there to connect with him at that level? It was exciting for me, one, to see how many people were here. And you got two levels of fans and supporters and followers of Christ that are out here to be a part of uh, such a great thing that's going on. And then look towards Jesus Christ has always been a great thing. And this is something to remind people of that. They will come publicly before thousands of people in what they say and how they live their lives how they play the game, and they're not afraid to profess Christ. They're brave and they're strong enough to do it. We, we look up to these guys as players, and their testimony that they follow God too. Articulating the gospel publicly, what does that do for you? You read the Bible and Jesus talks about being able to, to be bold and, and speak up and just talk about why he came to earth and died on the cross for us. You know, it's for our salvation and the hope and one person to be touched and blessed and, uh, you know, get, draw a little closer to Christ and it makes it all worth it. And Tom Buring also has a one-on-one -on -one interview with the Dodgers' Clayton Kershaw, and that's coming up later on today's show. So some good news to look forward to. Pat? That is beautiful news. You see that big crowd for that mm -hmm. Jesus Day? I, I love it. I, I mean, congratulations to Major League Baseball. Exactly. We've got enough bad stuff coming out of Major League Football. <laughs> this is encouraging. Let's hope mm -hmm. they keep it up. Terry? Well, coming up, changing our country on Capitol Hill through the power of prayer. I can tell you so many stories where we've gone into the prayer room, brought our requests before God, and then the next day we see answers to the prayers in the headlines. Meet Washington's prayer warriors after this. Plus, we've got your email. Debbie wants to know, how should Christians celebrate Yom Kippur? Your questions, honest answers, it's all still ahead. Well, as we mentioned earlier, the U.S. Supreme Court starts its new term today. Some say the justices are the highest authority in the land. But as Paul Strand reports, millions of prayer warriors are calling out to a much higher authority to bring about change in this great nation. Some people who care about how America is governed try to shape it in the halls of Congress, or through the White House and executive branch, or before the nation's courts, like that one. Others, though, are contending in the throne room of heaven. They've made interceding in prayer for their country pretty much a full-time mission. From its name, you can figure out that's what the Justice House of Prayer, or J-Hop, is doing. For 13 years, the people at J-Hop have been praying right on Capitol Hill, just a matter of feet away from the lawmakers and the judges of those laws. There's a lot of energy right now in the kingdom of God. Is Matt Lockett is Jay Hop's executive director. The way we're seeing prayer affect the nation, the nations of the earth, and the way we're seeing it impact culture. I think now's the best time to be alive. Now's the best time to be praying. Without a doubt, God accelerates his activity on the face of this earth through prayer. Otherwise, why else would he give us prayer? David Kubal's Intercessors for America is constantly webbing vast numbers of prayer warriors together via the internet, asking them to fast and pray on the first Friday of the month. To pray specifically for the nation. I mean, obviously, 1 Timothy chapter 2 is our mandate that we should pray for kings and all whom are in authority. But when praying about government and politics, Lockett says one of the toughest things is to see past your own prejudices and preferences so you can pray for God's will, not your will. 
We're not talking about an elephant or a donkey. We're talking about a lamb. And God has his own agenda. And if that means using Donald Trump, so be it. I know he, he's not a perfect man and uh, he definitely needs our prayers, but he is a man, I believe, that, that cares about spiritual things. Meanwhile, J-Hop is concentrating on the Supreme Court. You'll often see them out praying in front of it. And because battling abortion is a top priority for them, many wear tape across their mouths that says life, symbolizing the unborn babies who can't speak out for their own lives to be spared. All roads lead back to the Supreme Court. Whether we're talking about abortion or whether we're talking about marriage or any number of cultural issues. One thing these intercessors have learned is that God moves in mysterious ways. They see that as the Holy Spirit often moves them to pray in ways they don't understand at first, but which makes stunning sense later. Take, for instance, the new Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. Losing Justice Antonin Scalia in February of 2016 was extremely painful. And it, it pierced my heart. There was that moment of like, Oh my gosh. And many of them feared President Obama would replace Scalia with a liberal and change the balance of the court. Then came a crucial moment just after Scalia died when well-known prayer warrior Cindy Jacobs prophesied over Lockett. The word was that God has a champion that he's ready to bring up to this empty seat. That word to contend and faith and hold the court and to see God bring this champion to the bench. Everyone was 99% certain that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election. So you can imagine the pressure in the prayer room to hold on to a promise and to pray that into being. And we didn't know anything else except that God had a champion. Then the White House narrowed Trump's list of 21 possible nominees down to three. One of the guys on our team just felt inspired one day to look and see what, what are the names of these three and what do their names mean? We've been asking God to speak to us about a specific name to begin praying. And there was a guy on the list named Neil Gorsuch. And he looks and the meaning of Neil is champion. Well, you can imagine and our faith exploded in that moment. God actually had spoken to us who the next justice was gonna be a year prior and, uh, and that we had been praying for him by name. It's one of those things where, where it fills you with confidence that God, he's not just hearing our prayers, but he's actually moving in the earth. All these intercessors believe they're seeing God answering their prayers and invading the news. I teach them not to just read the headlines, but to make the headlines. And that's always like, this is incredible. Like God's actually hears, hears our prayers. I can tell you so many stories where we've gone into the prayer room, brought our requests before God, and then the next day we see answers to the prayers in the headlines. Kubal says if God is bringing a new sensation into your heart to intercede, go with it. There are men and women by the tens of thousands in this moment in time that God is putting a call upon their life to be an intercessor for America. And that gives me great hope because I know God is gonna do something great. I encourage our young people that this is how history is made, that history belongs to the intercessor. Anytime he puts his people to praying, he's gonna do something exciting, so watch out. Paul Strand, CBN News, Capitol Hill. Isn't that exciting? Neil was a champion. They were praying for a champion. And uh, there's the, <clears throat> the balance of the court has been restored, although I think Gorsuch is perhaps a, a more uh, astute an analyst of, of judicial policy than Scalia was. Scalia is a terrific guy. Uh, but yet Gorsuch is also a terrific guy, and I think he's going to amaze people. But uh, <clears throat> what they're looking at now is the possibility of one, two, three more retirements on the court. Yeah. Uh, if Kennedy retires, and there's some talk about him, uh, we replace him. I, Trump has the, uh, the building now, and they've taken away that, uh, that block that's in there, and they've got the, you know, the, whatever they call the nuclear option available so they can put more judges in. He can reshape the courts mm -hmm. and it would have the most profound of all the things that uh, Donald Trump could do. This could have the most lasting effect in America. And of all the things we could do, becoming intercessors on pray. his behalf and other leaders can change our nation. That's right. Change the trajectory. And we're not talking about anybody getting sick or dying or anything no. like that. We're just talking about, I mean, a man like Kennedy, he's healthy. But he's been the swing vote on a number of these things, like, like the same-sex marriage. And uh, somebody with a different perspective would change. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the whole concept of Roe versus Wade could be overturned with one more justice? 
It's amazing. Okay. That's the truth. Let's well, take some questions. Time for some questions with honest answers. Let's These come from you, and so we're happy, viewers, to be able to answer some of these for you. Pat, the first one comes from Debbie, who says, how should Christians celebrate Yom Kippur? All right. What does Yom Kippur mean? It is Yom means day, and Kafar was covering, and Yom Kippur was the day of covering or the day of atonement. And that was the day that high priest went into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled blood on the mercy seat. And that mercy seat was to cover the testimony of the law against the people. So it was a very holy day. It's the holiest day of the Israelites. How should Christians celebrate it? I think we could fast and we could pray along with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we want to have is is the covering of, of Jesus Christ is our covering. He's our lid of covering. And um, so we would ask that his, his, uh, his sacrifice for us would be activated uh, in a very real way. And that would be the way we could share Yom Kippur with our Jewish friends. Mm -hmm. All right. This is Lisa Pat who says, I've spent my life thinking that hell was a, quote, lake of fire. But scripture jumped out at me today from Revelation 20, 13 and 14, where it says that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. How is this possible? I can't seem to find a clear answer. Well, you know, they, they use terms like Hades, uh, and it, it, it has the idea of final judgment as well as an intermediate judgment. And um, I think whatever state people were in, that group of people would be cast into this lake of fire. That would be the ultimate destruction. But th there's so many images. The whole thing about hell is there's going to be torment. I, I think the torment of realizing that you could be in heaven for all eternity and you chose hell instead, and the torture of just doing that and being separated from God into outer darkness, mm -hmm. uh, it, it wouldn't take a whole bunch of fire eating at you uh, to, make, to make that a horrible experience. So, um, you know, is it, is it going to be the fire of torture, of conscience, or a regret, remorse? Who knows? But it, it'll be awful. Hell will be awful. And whatever, folks, you don't want to go there under any circumstances, yeah. however your theology works out, okay? Okay, this is Jared who says, why did God create our spirits different from our bodies? And why is this life temporary? Well, I mean, <laughs> how can I answer that? I mean, I mean, well, I, I think you ought to go to God and say, God, well, why did you do it that way? Well, it's up to him, not to me, to tell you how come. But, you know, we do have uh, a body, a spirit, and when the two are joined together, we become a nephesh or a soul. And so there is a soul, body, and spirit. Um, it kind of corresponds to the Trinity of God. Uh, but why did God do it that way? Uh, there's a part of us that's eternal. The spirit lives on forever. It doesn't die. It's not extinguished. When we die, the, the, the flesh part of us is going to die. It will, you know, be like ashes. It's gone. But the spirit will live on forever. And that's why hell and heaven are so important, because you in, in, inhabit them forever and ever and ever. You can't die. That's the thing about hell is so awful. You can't die. If you're in hell, you can't die. There's no end to it. It's on forever and ever and ever. Whereas heaven is forever and ever of bliss and joy and peace and love beyond measure, world without end. Amen. Okay. Okay, this is a viewer who says, if an unbelieving man divorces slash abandons his believing wife for unbiblical reasons, and if he has an affair with a married woman after the divorce is final, isn't he committing adultery in the eyes of God? I was told by someone that it was only adultery for the married woman, but not for him because he was divorced. That's nonsense. Uh, I mean, he's created the situation. Uh, he is uh, engaged in a conduct that uh, is adulterous. And um, he, he, you know, again, what's the Pauline privilege? 
if the unbelieving spouse is pleased to depart, let him depart. The brother or sister is not bound by that. So the, the believing spouse is not bound by the marriage vows because the unbeliever has left. Now, what's going to happen to him? I don't think that's up to us to say. But I will say, as far as I can tell, what he has done is committed adultery. The fact that uh, he has committed adultery uh, after the marriage is over uh, doesn't really make any difference. I mean, he is committing adultery. And, uh, but he'll pay for the, that along the way. And I don't know what else to say. That's in God's hands. All right. This is Nandor, who says in Psalm 82, 6, the Bible says, quote, Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. There is only one true God. So what does this verse mean? Well, it, it, if you use the term Elohim to describe uh, heavenly beings, uh, they use Elohim sometimes to describe angels. So uh, you are children of, of the living God, and uh, you're, you're like angels. So, you know, he's made man a little lower than the angels, but he's seen he will be clothed with glory and honor. Uh, the, the Elohim is the, is the operative word here. All right. Okay, this is a viewer who says, I've been working on breaking and denouncing my generational curses, starting with me and going all the way back to Adam and Eve on both sides of my parents' families. Can I break a generational curse off of another person, especially if it's a blood relative, or can I only pray for them? And what about in-laws? Oh, uh, that's a little too complex. <laughs> no, I don't think you can pray for the off a generational curse of somebody else. But um, I, I, I just don't understand all about that. So I think I'd, Does I'd, someone have to want to come out from under that generational curse themselves to break that? Well, you've got to know there's a generational curse. You to can go crazy with. going back. Well, I found a, a great, great, great grandfather. He had slaves, so he was a nasty man. So he's, I've got a generational curse in my family. Leave it alone. Came to set the captives free, right? Leave That's it alone. Jesus said. All right. <laughs> okay. This is Connie who says, in Revelation 21 and 22, John sees the new Jer Jerusalem come down from heaven and the tree of life. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I've often wondered why there would be a need for healing in the new Jerusalem. <laughs> you all have got some great questions today, don't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer any of these questions. How come you want healing in heaven? Well, heaven is healing, and you are uh, uh, living uh, in a new reality. But uh, the fact, I think a lot of these things are symbolic, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're talking about a tree with, with leaves that are for healing. I think that's symbolic. There is going to be healing for the people of God who live in heaven. Mm -hmm. They will be like angels. And so why would you need a tree uh, with leaves when you have got a heavenly body yes. that doesn't need healing? So I think it's symbolic. We're talking about the fact that you're in the presence of God and, and there will be glorious healing. There'll be no sickness, no, no sorrow, no disease, no death in heaven. That's the way it's going to be, okay? Well, that's all the time we have for today. <laughs> Thank, Thank goodness. you, God, for your answers, really. <laughs> This is all, but you need the Lord himself to come and answer those yes, things. Yes, yeah. I'm, I can't step into his shoes. I just can't do it. Right. We release you from that. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, up next, Clayton Kershaw steps up to the mound. I'm pitching for a lot more than just winning a baseball game and trying to honor him and everything I'm doing. And, you know, winning's pretty fun, too. So uh, I like doing that. More from the man some are calling the best pitcher of his generation. That's happening when we come back. Well, baseball playoffs begin this week, and among the advancing field of 10 teams is the Los Angeles Dodgers. With baseball's best record, the Dodgers have secured home field through the postseason. They'll host the National League wildcard winner Friday night. 
And on the mound for the Dodgers will be their pitching ace, Clayton Kershaw. He's a three-time Cy Young Award winner, a seven-time All-Star star, plus the league MVP player. And as sports reporter Tom Buring discovered, Kershaw is also a humble man who gives all the glory to God. Dodger Stadium is iconic, isn't it? Home to some of baseball's greatest pitchers since it opened in 1962, and we've all been watching another. Clayton Kershaw is arguably the best pitcher of his generation and could finish his career as the game's greatest ever. By the time you reach the stadium and take the mound on a start, what ignites that competitive drive for you? First of all, I know I didn't do anything to deserve the talent you know, that God gave me, but what a blessing it is to get to throw a baseball for a living, and I know I'm very privileged to get to do that. So that said, I don't want to take it for granted. You know, I want to do everything I possibly can to make it worth my while, make it worth God's time, and you know, with that comes a competitive advantage. You know, I think I'm, I'm pitching for a lot more than just winning a baseball game and trying to honor him and everything I'm doing, and you know, winning's pretty fun too, so uh, I like doing that. Three Cy Youngs, an MVP, seven All-Star games, it stamps greatness, but how do you how do you define excellence? Yeah, you know, I think when I retire, I can look back on all that. You know, right now, you know, I've never won a World Series. Our team has been in the playoffs a lot. This year's no different. I'm on a great team, and I think that's everybody's goal in there. I think that's the benefit of getting to go to the playoffs so many times is that we've had that taste and uh, realized that it's worth playing for. And, uh, you know, winning that last game of the season is what, uh, is what we're all here for. Give me your go-to pitch, and if you don't mind, give me the grip. Oh, I mean, I throw a fastball the most, I guess. So just uh, just like that, four-seam fastball across the laces like that. And if that's coming out right, if you're throwing that where you want to, usually everything else kind of works off that. And the slider? Yeah, slider, similar to the fastball. You know, if the horseshoe's on this side for my fastball, I just rotate the ball up and put the horseshoe on this side and kind of grip the side of it and, and just try to throw straight through the baseball. And yeah, I throw that a lot. You know, that's an important pitch for me. I uh, get guys off my fastball for sure. The cool thing to me is that very grip has a ripple effect practically. Kershaw's challenge, every strikeout benefiting the underprivileged. What is it about the legacy after you leave the game that is far more reaching than baseball? I think you said it right there, you know, baseball's gonna end someday. I realize that, you know, as soon as you retire, you know, people forget about you in this game fast. There's, an, there's the next young guy coming up that's always better than you, so. For me, it's just about using baseball as a platform to doing a lot of things, and my wife uh, really help, reminds me of that every single day. You know, Kershaw's Challenge started with her and uh, started with a little girl named Hope over in Africa, and just to see where it's come from then to where it is now, and you know, it's completely God ordained. We didn't have any of that planned in our lives. You know, we just uh, we wanted to help one girl, and God's turned it into this through through the uh, gift of baseball. That's the legacy that you're after, being His hands and feet. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's. Uh, you know, we're all trying to do that in whatever aspect of life we're in, whatever job we have. You know, I think that's our calling is just, uh, you know, whatever sphere of influence that God gives you to try and make an impact for his kingdom. And um, he gave me baseball to do that. And thankfully, a lot of people like baseball. And about excellence, you demonstrate that in the way that you pitch. What is it for the church at large, do you think, that we could demonstrate even better excellence? It's a tough question. You know, I think, uh, you know, a lot, of good, a lot of things get wrestled around with Christianity in this day and age about, what it means, what it stands for, and I think it gets the wrong connotation all over the world. So I think for me, in using baseball and using Jesus' name, I just really want to focus on Him. You know, I don't want to think about Christianity or the religious aspect of it. You just, you just want to focus on Jesus and loving Jesus. And when you do that, there's so many things that come off of that that people can understand. Saying you are a Christian shouldn't turn people off. You should, uh, you should love people well, and that's Jesus' first commandment. What's most uniquely exceptional about the Christ that you follow? That's a great question. I mean, I think first and foremost that when you look at every other religion all over the world, it's works-based. You have to earn your way to the kingdom. You know, with Jesus, it's so different because we didn't do anything to deserve him. You know, he literally died for us and saved us. There's nothing else like that in the world. There's no other God like that. Uh, that's why I believe in him. And uh, I'm thankful that it's not to me because I fail every single day. But, you know, he's there to uh, give us grace. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing. Lots of wisdom in what Clayton Kershaw has to share. And you know, today I think it's so important for you and I to understand that it's not about religion. You know, sometimes Jesus gets rejected because people have had a bad church experience or they have preconceived ideas because of how Christians have lived inappropriately before them about who Jesus is. I love what Clayton said. I just wanna get, get to Jesus, just wanna go to him. You know what, don't judge 
the Jesus that we love and serve and the one who died for your sins by the performance of other people who've been misguided. Just go to Jesus. Just find out who he is. Just commit your life and your days and your performance, if you will, in your life to him. We have the privilege, not the res we, it's not something we have to do or feel oppressed to do. It's something we do with joy to thank him for loving us, that we don't have to perform. We don't have to do anything to get there from here. That's what he did on the cross. He covered it all. All he asks from us is to come to him, just to come to him, to lay down doing it ourselves, to lay down that performance concept, to lay down all of our anxieties and all of our pain and all of the past history of our lives and to just say, Jesus, I just give myself to you. Acknowledging that we are sinners in need of a savior and that's why he went to the cross. It's not because he didn't have anything else to do that day. It was because he already knew you were coming into the world. He already knew what your life would be and he wants so much for you to be in heaven with him. He wants that for all of us. The Bible says that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it also says that there is no other name under heaven by which men may be saved. So today, if you're listening to Clayton talk about what Jesus means to him and how he lives his life, if that opens up some kind of a hunger in you to know more, to be focused in your life, to not be religious, but to be relational with Jesus. It all starts with a simple prayer. And what is prayer but just talking to God? You just say, Jesus, I need you. I want to know you like Clayton knows you. I want my sins to be forgiven like Clayton's sins have been forgiven. I want to understand that when I leave here, I'm going to heaven. I want to spend eternity with you. Will you forgive my sins? Will you come into my heart and my life? Will you teach me your ways and guide my life and my choices? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's that simple. But now what? What do you do now that you've prayed the prayer? How do you become a disciple of Jesus? Because that's really the goal. Well, we've got some information to help you with that. Pat's put this packet together just for you. It's called A New Day, and it's filled with wonderful information on how do you follow Jesus? How do you become his follower, his disciple, his child? We'd love for you to have this. It's completely free. Even the number to get it is free. It's right there on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I just prayed that prayer, and I'd like the New Day packet. We will get it out to you right away. Thanks for your call, and thank you for listening to what Clayton had today to say and put, putting it into action in your own life. Well, still ahead, he stirs up excitement wherever he goes. I got to meet Gizmo. We took some pictures with him. Um, my friends and I, we really enjoyed it. We're going to show you all the joy that Gizmo generates. That's coming up later. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Two terrorist attacks in two countries over the weekend. In Edmonton, Canada, disturbing video shows a vehicle slamming into a police officer. The suspect begins stabbing the officer before running off. Two hours later, he's spotted at a checkpoint in a moving van. The suspect fled again, hitting four people before flipping the truck and being captured. The police officer was released from the hospital. Authorities say an ISIS-type flag was found in the suspect's car. Meanwhile, in Marseille, France, a terrorist killed two women in a train station. He slit one woman's neck and stabbed the other in the stomach. They were just 17 and 20 years old. He attacked a woman who was sitting five to six meters away from me. It felt like a nightmare. And then started shouting, Alua Akbar, God is great. Horrible. Then soldiers on patrol shot and killed him. ISIS is claiming responsibility for those attacks as well. CBN is on the ground helping people in Mexico after the two recent deadly earthquakes there. Volunteers are providing food, water, medical care. 
and a whole lot of prayer. CBN workers are also helping remove debris and building homes. Our teams are ministering to children by showing Superbook in their native language. CBN Mexico will continue to pray and help those in need as long as it takes. And you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Terry, we'll be back right after this. Wherever the fun-loving robot Gizmo appears, a party is sure to follow. And that's exactly what took place recently at a Virginia Beach church where two episodes of CBN Superbook were shown. Take a look. The kids were all smiles at a recent Superbook special event at St. Gregory the Great Church in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I got to meet Gizmo. Um, we took some pictures with him. Um, my friends and I, we really enjoyed it. Deacon Daryl Wentworth started the evening with a familiar message. He has long told people that to know God, they have to read and understand the Bible. He inspired all of that scripture for each one of us. So ignorance of his word is ignorance of him. When a friend gave him some Superbook DVDs, he thought they'd be a great way to teach the Bible to his grandkids. So I gave them to my son-in-law, who was using them for my grandkids, and it evangelized my son-in-law as well. Afterward, everyone gathered for a free dinner. Kids enjoyed Superbook coloring books and getting their picture taken with Gizmo. CBN's Wendy O'Rourke was on hand to tell folks more about Superbook. For example, the Superbook Bible app. It's free, it has the whole Bible in a number of languages, and also it has entire Superbook episodes that people can show their kids on their phone or their tablet anytime and anywhere. After dinner, families enjoyed two exciting episodes of Superbook, David and Goliath and the Apostle Paul's shipwreck. Both resonated with kids and adults alike. If you need help and if you're like, it's so hard, never give up. Each family received a take-home bag of Superbook gifts, including a Superbook DVD. As Christians, uh, we're called to love one another and learn from one another. And I'm glad that uh, CBN was able to come over to St. Gregory's and, and bring Superbook. Jesus, you died upon a cross and rose again to save the lost. Just like the children at this event, kids all over the world love Superbook. I'm very glad they had it, and I also hope they do it again. You can see how much fun that was, but we'd love for you to be a part of bringing the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. And when you join the Superbook DVD Club, you're doing just that. You'll also receive three copies of the latest Superbook episode for your recurring gift of $25 on a credit or debit card. And then every four weeks, you're going to be one of the first to receive the newest Superbook episode. And your account will be automatically debited $25. When you join today, you're going to receive three copies of Explorer 11, which features two Superbook DVDs, Job and the Good Samaritan. It's got Bible background videos, music videos, and so much more. All you have to do to participate in this is to just call 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to CBN.com. So join now. DVD Club members can also stream all episodes of season one and two, and that's for free. You'll never find a better deal, but you will help us take the message of the gospel to children around the world when you join. Coming up, a woman suffers with searing stomach pain for years. See how she's supernaturally healed in an instant after this. For two years, the woman in our next story couldn't eat and she couldn't sleep. She wasted away to just 73 pounds. She saw countless doctors and specialists, but never was able to find relief until she went through what she called the worst day of her life. The sooner I wake up in the morning, that was immediately, that pain was getting me right here at the top of my stomach. It was like a fire and that makes me bombing in and bombing in. Then I was all day with that pain. No relief, I couldn't sleep good. 
headaches. It was making me feel all my body not function for nothing. The doctor gave me some medication. It helped me a little bit, but then I was starting feeling that pain again. It was like 24 seven, my pain. They put the camera inside my stomach. They do all tests that a human being could have in their body, on their stomach and everything, but they never find nothing, only a little bit acid reflux. For two years, I was suffering of all that, no eating, no nothing, only drinking liquids. It was the grace of God that keep me every day. So I had to go to the hospital, to the emergency room almost twice of every week. They just put me a little bit IV, calmed me a little bit of pain and sent me home because they didn't know what else to do either with me. I lost more than 30 something pounds, but I went almost to 73 pounds. Honestly, it would be time that you wanted to give up. We are human. But I said, no, Lord, you have a purpose with all this. That day I wake up so like the worst day of my life. Then we put the 700 club like always. We see Golden, and then he decides to give a word of knowledge. There's someone you've had recurring problems with acid reflux and you've damaged your esophagus and there's like a permanent burning. Uh, permanent heartburn, and, and you don't know what to do. God's healed it right now in Jesus' name. And I put my hand up, and I believe it. Like I told you, it was instant, instant. I feel that Holy Spirit. It was, it was something so beautiful. And after that, no pain, no nothing, nothing. I stand praising God and giving God all the glory, all the glory to Him for the thing that He has done. After two years and something, I had some pancakes and I was, I was eating. <laughs> Everything had a purpose, why I went through with all this, for I could be a blessing for somebody else. And yes, my faith is being more strong than ever. Yes, thank God. I want Narita's story to be a blessing to you today. If your faith hasn't been strengthened enough by that to believe for your own miracle, here's the story of Anthony. He lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico, suffered with severe outdoor allergies. Even with medication, he had to stay inside most of the time. He began calling the CBM Prayer Center on three different occasions for prayer for healing, and he realized that after each time that he prayed with someone there, he got better. Then one Saturday, Anthony was able to help his dad all day with yard work. He's had no symptoms at all, even though he did not take his medication, and since then, those allergies have not returned. Listen, God wants to do something special in your life today. We don't have to call it out. You just need to believe. Lift up your hands right now. Let's pray together and you receive what God brings to you today. Father, we thank you that you are such a good father, that you hear our voices, that you see our need, that you walk through our pain with us. And God, today as your children cry out, would you just speak a word into their point of need? Jesus, would you come and heal the brokenhearted? Those who have been devastated, God, who seem without hope, Jesus, would you just speak a word of health and wholeness and healing to them? Father, I just pray for those who are suffering physically, that you would touch their bodies from the top of their head to the bottom of their toes and heal them. In Jesus' name, let what was accomplished on Calvary come to rest upon them today. Now, in the name of Christ, we pray. And Father, for those who are wanting you, needing you, wandering without you, God, would you just now bring the truth of who you are resident to their hearts? Holy Spirit, blow the, blow the breath of faith over those who desire and need to know you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have a need in your life and you want to pray with someone today, our number is always open and available, 1-800. 707,000, please call. And we want to leave you with today's power minute. It's from Matthew 12, 15, and he healed them all. God bless you.